Bill Shankly was born in Glenbuck, Ayrshire, a small Scottish village primarily known for coal mining. During Shankly's birth year of 1913, the village had a population of approximately 700 people. Due to limited job opportunities, many of Glenbuck's inhabitants left the village to seek work in larger coal mines. Consequently, Glenbuck became mostly deserted over time. When Shankly's ghostwriter, John Roberts, visited the village in 1976, he found only 12 houses remaining, one of which belonged to Shankly's sister Elizabeth. Roberts referred to Elizabeth as the last of the children of Glenbuck. John and Barbara Shankly, Bill's parents, resided in one of the Auchenstillic cottages along with their ten children, consisting of five boys and five girls. Shankly happened to be the youngest boy and the ninth child overall. Although he was widely known as Bill during his football career, within the family, he was called Willie. John, Bill's father, was a postman who later turned into a tailor and specialized in creating handmade suits. Even though football talent ran in the family, John Shankly did not engage in the sport himself. In any case, Shankly's playing career, while not legendary, shaped him as a successful future coach. He played for teams such as Carlisle United and Preston North End. According to Shankly's autobiography, he considered tackling to be an art form and believed that timing was crucial. He never received a yellow or red card and believed that as long as the ball was won in a tackle, even if the opponent was injured, it was not a foul. His approach was to play hard but fairly and avoid cheating. He learned from his brothers not to argue with referees as it was a futile exercise, and he was known for his commitment to football, often training during the summer months. During one summer, he decided to improve his throwing skills and practice throwing balls over houses with the help of children from his village. Bill Shankly started his managerial career at Carlisle United, where he had previously played. Despite the team's remote location and struggling position in the 3rd Division North, Shankly's dedication and tactics led them to climb the ranks and narrowly miss promotion. He also used psychological tactics and public outreach to rally support for the team. Shankly's success at Carlisle led to the discovery of talented players like Jeff Twentyman, who later joined Shankly at Liverpool as a chief scout. However, Shankly's time at Carlisle ended abruptly when he accused the club's board of not fulfilling a promise to award bonuses to players. Despite this, Shankly's overall record at Carlisle was 42 wins and 22 defeats in 95 league matches. Shankly managed Grimsby Town from June 1951, where he faced challenges, such as the team's recent relegation and the loss of key players. Despite this, he remained optimistic and utilized five-a-side football in training, focusing on improving set pieces. The team had a good start in the 1952-53 season but eventually finished fifth. Shankly was disappointed when the board refused to allocate funds for new players in the 1953-54 season and resigned due to the lack of ambition. He was also homesick and took the opportunity to manage Workington, which was closer to Scotland. Shankly's record at Grimsby was 62 wins and 35 defeats out of 118 matches. Shankly took on the challenge of managing Workington, despite their low position in the league, and managed to improve their standing. They finished 18th in the 1953-54 season and 8th in 1954-55, with an increase in attendance. Shankly had to take on administrative tasks due to the club's tight financial situation, including collecting the payroll from the bank each week. The shared ground with the local rugby league club led to disputes with the board, mostly comprised of rugby enthusiasts. Shankly left Workington on November 15, 1955, to become assistant manager at Huddersfield Town, achieving 35 wins and 27 defeats in 85 league matches during his time as manager. Shankly started as a reserve team coach at Huddersfield, where he coached some talented young players who eventually joined the first team. He became the manager in 1956, but was unable to lead the team to promotion. 
Shankly's Huddersfield team included Test cricketer Ken Taylor, striker Les Massey, and captain Bill McGarry. He witnessed a remarkable game where Huddersfield lost 7-6 to Charlton Athletic after leading 5-1 with 27 minutes left, and also won 5-0 against Liverpool with 10 men. Shankly became disillusioned with Huddersfield's board and accepted an offer to manage Liverpool, who were also in the second division, in November 1959. After rumours circulated, Shankly resigned on December 1, 1959, with a league record of 49 wins and 47 losses in 129 matches. When Shankly arrived at Anfield in 1959, Liverpool was in a state of disarray. The team had been relegated to the second division for five years and had suffered a humiliating defeat against non-league Worcester City in the FA Cup. The facilities at Anfield and Melwood were in poor condition, and Shankly requested funds to fix them. The Liverpool squad consisted mainly of average players with some promising reserves. Despite the challenges, Shankly settled in quickly at his new club and felt a strong connection with the supporters, whom he considered to be his own kind of people. He built solid working relationships with the coaching staff, including Bob Paisley, Joe Fagan, and Reuben Bennett, who shared his values of loyalty to one another in the club. While Shankly was the driving force behind Liverpool's motivation, Paisley was the key tactician, according to Kelly. The quartet's legacy to football included the transformation of an old storage room into the famous boot room, which served as a space for tactical discussions and boot cleaning and repairs. Shankly renovated the old and overgrown Melwood by implementing a development program, and had the players change at Anfield before going to and from Melwood by bus. The training system introduced by Shankly, Paisley, Fagan, and Bennett was critical to Liverpool's success. Shankly preferred training on grass using a ball, and structured exercise routines systematically to achieve set targets. Competitive five-a-side games were also part of the system. Shankly created a routine called the sweat box to improve stamina, reflexes, and ball skills. The routine was limited to two minutes per session and was part of Shankly's pass-and-move philosophy, which formed the basis of Liverpool's strategy. Shankly emphasized cooling off periods after training and changing the studs in the players' boots to suit different playing conditions. In 1961, Shankly signed two Scottish players, Ron Yates and Ian St. John, with the help of Sawyer. He challenged the Liverpool board to fire him if the players didn't perform well. Shankly praised Yates' height at a press conference. He also acquired Gordon Milne from Preston and developed other players. Liverpool finished third in the previous seasons, but in the 1961-62 season, the new team won the second division championship and was promoted, with Roger Hunt scoring 41 goals, Liverpool finished eighth in their first top-flight season under Shankly in 1962-63, but consolidated their position. Notable signings included Willie Stevenson from Rangers and Peter Thompson from Preston. Liverpool's youth system produced future England internationals Ian Callaghan, Tommy Smith, and Chris Lawler. In 1963-64, Liverpool won their sixth league championship title, and Shankly was credited for their fitness level. Jimmy Melia was transferred to Wolverhampton Wanderers in 1964, and Shankly purchased Arsenal's Jeff Strong for £40,000, marking Liverpool's last major transfer until 1967. Liverpool's main objective when Shankly took over as manager was to win the FA Cup, which they achieved in May 1965 with a 2-1 victory over Leeds United, and Shankly considered it his greatest achievement. The Beatles sent Shankly a telegram wishing the team good luck before the final. Liverpool also made their European debut in 1964-65, reaching the semi-finals and adopting the red kit for good. In the second round of the European Cup, Shankly decided to experiment with the kit and don the full red kit, which he felt would make the players look taller. 
Liverpool beat Inter Milan 3-1 in the first leg of the semi-final of the European Cup after winning the FA Cup in 1965. However, the second leg at San Siro was controversial and Liverpool lost 3-0, leading to their elimination from the competition. Shankly later claimed that two of Inter's goals were illegal, but video evidence shows that the goals were actually legitimate. Liverpool finished in 7th place in the 1964-65 Football League Championship with 13 fewer points than the previous season, possibly due to their involvement in the FA and European Cups. Liverpool won the league championship title and reached the final of the European Cup Winners' Cup in the 1965-66 season. However, they lost the final 2-1 to Borussia Dortmund in extra time, with Shankly describing the team's performance as poor and conceding two silly goals. Shankly and Paisley learned from their experience in European football and developed a tactic of containment away and attack at home in two-legged ties. This strategy was used in a preliminary round match against Juventus, where Liverpool was losing 1-0 in the first leg away but managed to keep the deficit to one goal and 1-2-0 in the second leg at Anfield. Liverpool started the 1966-67 season by winning the FA Charity Shield against Everton, but finished fifth in the league and did not contend for major honours. Shankly recognized the potential of Emlyn Hughes and signed him for £65,000 in February 1967. Liverpool performed poorly in the 1966-67 European Cup, struggling to overcome FC Petrolo Ploiesti in the first round and losing 5-1 to Ajax Amsterdam in the last 16. Shankly complained about the match in Amsterdam starting due to fog, but still thought Liverpool could win at Anfield. Shankly claimed he was not concerned about the Ajax defeat but was looking ahead. However, the Liverpool website disagrees, stating that Shankly was wrong to delay team rebuilding. Liverpool's defeat to Watford in the 1969-70 FA Cup quarter-final spelled the end for several key players, including St. John, Hunt, Byrne, Yates, and Lawrence. Shankly responded by bringing in new players, such as Clements, Lindsay, Lloyd, Toshak, Hall, and Hayway, who joined existing players to form the core of Liverpool's successful team in the 1970s. To discover new talent, Shankly developed a scouting system in 1967 that was managed by Jeff Twentyman, his former player. This system was instrumental in finding players who eventually became part of Liverpool's success. Shankly's scouting approach was straightforward, seeking players with basic abilities to pass and move, a positive attitude, and the heart to play for Liverpool. Rather than pay high transfer fees for established players, Shankly preferred to develop young players. After Shankly's retirement, 20 Man continued to provide valuable service by discovering players like Phil Neal, Alan Hansen, and Ian Rush for Bob Paisley and Joe Fagan. Liverpool's new team, created in the 1970-71 season, reached the FA Cup final and semi-finals of the Intercities Fairs Cup, but lost both matches due to their lack of experience. A significant new addition to the team was Kevin Keegan, who was signed on the recommendation of Chief Scout Jeff Twentyman. Liverpool missed out on winning the league championship by one point, with Shankly believing they were denied a definite penalty in a critical away match against Derby and a good goal disallowed in their final match against Arsenal. Despite these setbacks, Shankly was optimistic about the team's overall performance and believed they would be successful in the next season. In the 1972-73 season, Liverpool won their eighth league title and their third under Shankly, as well as their first UEFA Cup by defeating Borussia Mönchengladbach 3-2 on aggregate in the final. Liverpool broke a record of 21 consecutive home wins in the league, which was later surpassed by Jurgen Klopp's team. However, they did not perform well in the 1973-74 European Cup and were eliminated by Red Star Belgrade in the second round. Liverpool finished second to Leeds in the league championship that year. Despite a late equaliser in the third round against Doncaster Rovers, Liverpool won the replay and reached the final of the FA Cup.
In Shankly's last competitive game in charge, Liverpool defeated Newcastle 3-0 at Wembley after an impressive second-half performance. In his autobiography, Shankly highlighted the importance of prioritizing fans and treating them well to gain their support, especially at Liverpool where fans are crucial. He believed in connecting with fans and acknowledging the significance of their team in their lives. Shankly demonstrated his respect towards fans by wearing a Liverpool scarf that a policeman had discarded during a trophy presentation. He also stressed the importance of maintaining open communication with supporters and personally responded to their letters at Workington. Shankly would obtain match tickets for deserving fans and expressed a willingness to give people anything reasonable. Bill Shankly received the OBE for months after retiring as Liverpool manager, and he and his wife Nessie continued to live in their West Derby home until their deaths. Shankly remained connected to football in retirement, working for Radio City 96.7, advising Wrexham and Tranmere Rovers, and assisting John Toshak at Swansea City. Although there were rumors of a return to management, Shankly stayed active by participating in five-a-side football and maintaining his fitness. After his death, Nessie continued to live in their home until her passing in 2002. Bill Shankly was admitted to the hospital following a heart attack and died on September 29, 1981, after suffering another cardiac arrest. Tributes poured in from the football world, and his ashes were scattered on the Anfield pitch. Liverpool celebrated his life during their first home league game after his passing. One fan held up a banner that read, Shankly Lives Forever. 